off the air in our preamble, I kind of suggested I've been working on this problem um, in economics, um, and I'm going to set that up, and uh, and I think this podcast could be a cool way too to try and bridge economics um, with with sort of personality theory, perception, uh, and phenomenology. Um, so so let's, let's start with that. Um, if if that, if that if that makes sense to you and sounds good, okay. sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, it's it's economists they they like to you know it's funny to to set up some my, the problem I want to kind of focus on is risk preferences uh, how people make decisions um, under risk and uncertainty uh, and I guess the way and reason why economists want to think they can do this is that. Um, consumption can kind of all be turned into money equivalents, right? And therefore, one of the on, only real necessary things we need to do to map out the way a person acts in the world is then give them different gambles or different lotteries, you know, how some certain is, you know, do you, do you value this thing that's of certainty of 20 pounds versus, you know, this gamble of 50 pounds, but, you know, there's a 50% chance you get it and 50% chance you get zero. And if you give them a sufficiently broad range of these kinds of questions um, of gambles, then because you now know how they respond to different money amounts and different levels of risk, um, I mean that that's it's kind of a crucial and and you know um, uh, sufficient thing that, to to map out the way they're going to act um, because again you can they have the way economists would think about it. And, and definitely there are things which sort of go against this, but they, they would have sort of complete preferences. Um, and then they can go out into the world uh, and uh, start making decisions. Um, and uh, so anyway, there's, lot, there's lots about to what degree the people have preferences that, that aren't there or what even preferences are, are preferences. Um, and to what degree can someone be said to have sort of stable sets of um, things they, they, they want and things they, you know, they know them all a priori. And that's something we can get into, um, because you know, uh, it's uh, it's kind of it's kind of fascinating because once you have sort of behavioral economists, you know, particularly Kahneman and Tversky and behavioral economics coming and saying, well, actually, um, we know that people in these risky decisions they don't make um, actions like some sort of perfect um, utility maximizer. Uh, you know, just viewing the world sort of completely optimally, um, then those sort of uh, cons you know, considerations of, you know, people can sort of just perfectly um, have have clear preferences and go out in the world and start making decisions, you know, on many different domains that starts falling apart. And then one particular th I'm interested in is Kahneman Tversky's um, probability weighting in, in prospect theory, which I can put up as a graph. Um, for listeners now, and it kind of says that people have this, this classic phenomenon whereby we overweight small probabilities and we underweight large ones. And it can change for different individuals under different circumstances. And you can even think about the broader question of how useful even is a measure of this, of people trying to see problems of, you know, 20 pounds with certainty gone. So, so j j just an example of that. Um, it, 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 we're more concerned about the airplane crashing than the car that we're driving every day crashing, even though the probabilities are uh, uh, um, uh, like there's a reversal there. Right, it's it's right. more likely that uh, my, uh, I'll you know get into a car crash, which I completely neglect in the everyday, than it is that my plane will crash, which I'm much more concerned about. So there's a salience difference there. That that's yes. what. You mean. Mm -hmm. Yes, and 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 you know, there are many different. Um, biases and uh, and for, so for example, bait, you know, you're neglecting base rates and and I think what this probability weighting scheme does and why it's so helpful is that yeah, you have like the intuitive fact that yeah, we do actually see often airplanes as you know more safe, you know, or, you know, more scary than cars. Um, but you know, just you know, genuinely, if you look at like the facts and the probabilities, and way more safe. Um, and I think. The probability weighting scheme is kind of a um, an elegant way that economists really like to say, okay, this can actually explain a whole lot of different decisions that people make and encapsulates a lot of the different biases and heuristics that people would have. 
Um, and it's a way to quantify it. And, you know, it's, it's really, it is interesting because, you know, to what degree is it helpful to quantify this? I mean, again, I, the point I was just going to make is um, how literate are people with probabilities, right? You know, they're making these decisions on these choice tasks um, of, you know, get this with certainty versus get this with, you know, 50% probability. And it is an interesting question of how intuitive is seeing probabilities um, given that we, in a genuine, in our normal day life, we're not, there's no one that's going to say this is going to happen with 33% probability. There could, in some, you know, deep sense, be something that's kind of alienating about that. But nevertheless, that's fine because that kind of gets to even the kinds of questions and the kind of issues that I want to raise here um, of, because I suspect, and the reason, one of the reasons why I want to talk to you today is that people of different personality types might view probabilities and view and understand the world and maybe not even just risky decisions but just decisions in general they might see the world differently and it could show up uh in something like this probability weighting scheme when you actually measure it and you see differences such that for example um some personality traits uh, uh, could for example, actually see probabilities more accurately in the sense of bringing it more to this 45 degree line of they're actually not under or overweighting it. Um, and uh, so I, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the proposal I can get into why I suspect that, but I think in talking to you off the air, you kind of made sense to you given your thinking and of personality and like a phen phenomenological perspective. Uh, and as we've talked sort of in our previous podcasts, um, your theory of personality bridges personality with relevance realization, with Anfa Veiki's theory of consciousness and how sort of we navigate the world as limited cognitive agents. And therefore the world is genuinely going to be appearing to us and manifesting to us each individually differently. And so I wonder what you think of that proposal mm -hmm. and mm -hmm how and how useful might personality theory and your understanding of phenomenological personality theory help in trying to explain this kind of economic phenomena? Great. Okay. So let's actually step away from personality for the moment. Let's get our bearings right. Um, so the, the, the sort of behavioral economics turn, um, what it, as far as I'm concerned, what it was based on was the realization that human decision making isn't predicated on a kind of idealized, fully logical um, process, where uh, the sort of like criterion of rationality at play is idealized or ideal rationality, where what we do is constantly maximize rewards and minimize risks. And there's this optimization process going. It's not a computational process that's taking place that's guiding our decision making. Instead, there was this turn toward a, a, an account of bounded rationality that we, um, the decision making that we're actually engaged in is uh, based on a number of, let's say, reflex like uh, machineries that we can call heuristics which are good enough solutions or strategies that we can adopt and implement across situations that at least enough of the time lead to uh, like good enough problem solutions. And what a heuristic is, is really just a, a kind of rule of thumb. And it's a rule of thumb that we implement not by knowing about it, but it's, it's very pre-reflective. It's pre-propositional. That, that's why I uh, uh, said that it's reflex-like. And the issue with heuristics is that there is no such thing as a free lunch. So um, uh, people in economics and psychology and related disciplines have heard this, um, uh, this notion, right? That every strategy that is good for solving problems in some contexts is gonna, is gonna be counterproductive in other contexts. So every heuristic, as meaningful and effective as it might be in some contexts, is going to become a bias when generalized into other contexts, such as, for example, the heuristic, tell the truth. 
So this is the famous sort of uh, uh, ethical dilemma that, you know, that they level against uh, Kantians, as, uh, against deontologists. If the maxim is to tell the truth, then what do you do when a serial killer arrives at your doorstep and asks for the location of uh, their next victim that you actually know? Uh, do you tell the truth because that's what the imperative is? Or do you lie in order to save the life? Well, telling the truth is a good principle to have, but it's going to run, run up against its uh, limits depending on the kinds of context that you'll find yourself in. So there's this idea, again, that every heuristic, although it works well in some contexts, is going to become a bias in other contexts. Okay, how does this connect to the idea of bounded rationality? Well, the, despite the limitations that come with heuristics, they're actually effective because they're quick and dirty ways of moving about in the world. This is what in the rationality literature they referred to as uh, our, our tendency to be cognitive misers. We, it's much more metabolically costly to spend a lot of time thinking through and exploring a problem space in all of its conditions and constraints and all the operations that are available to us to sort of adopt and enact to get to a solution than it is to just rely on a rule of thumb, so to speak. All that time and energy that would be expended on exhausting the problem space, which in the final analysis is impossible, given that the problem space is virtually infinite in its size, in its vastness. Um, we avoid all of that. We sidestep all of that by just having these quick and dirty ways of going around the world. Um, uh, so like another very basic and relatable example might be that when you walk into a lecture hall, th this example is taken from the phenomenological tradition, by the way, Heidegger used it. When you walk, in, walk into a lecture hall, uh, you don't scan the room and every single object in it to then orient yourself in the proper way to make your way to the seat. You, you notice all this pre-reflectively based on how, how all the chairs are arranged, what direction they're facing, where the podium is. Uh, all this tells you almost immediately where the front and the back of the room are and where you should go. It's like the room calls uh, uh, calls for you to act in a certain way. It invites you. It tells you. And you don't think through this. You just see it. It's embedded in the perceptual schemes at play already in a kind of reflex-like way. These are all heuristics that are at play. The way in which your perception is guided is in a heuristic fashion and mm -hmm. you're uh, what's that's, up that's very helpful no no, no that, that's I, I i like you bringing in and contextualizing what behavioral economics is doing um which is that we are limited cognitive agents and therefore it would be kind of impossible to rationally like a computer compute the you know, the, the problem space of, you know, going into an entire room or, you know, rationally, um, you know, compute, you know, exactly the degree to which I should tell the truth versus lie in any particular situation based on my long-term prospects and mm -hmm. risk attitude. It's, it's no, there are heuristics because we have to navigate this really complex world. Um, and uh, it's funny because, you know, again, say classic behavioral economists like Don Kahneman and Tversky in, in their book, Thinking Fast and Slow, they, they kind of would propose that there's a system one, which is these more biases and heuristics and more quick and dirty kind of thinking versus a system two, which is the ability to rationalize and um, put in more cognitive effort, but then make a better decision. Um, but here's the interesting thing, um, because on the one level, you could say, okay, and what they kind of propose in that book in, in some ways is um, we need to just try and engage system two more and more. Um, since system one, it makes sense that we have it, say from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, and just as agents that are need to make quicker decisions. But since it goes wrong, uh, you know, decent amount of the time, we should just try and think more consciously and rationally about problems. Um, but the problem is, is that you can only really 
do that in situations that are well defined, in situations that you know. Um, and so to to bring this back round to say what my my problematic of this probability weighting, and to what degree can mm. you try and understand the differences in people's perception of the world um, uh, mm -hmm. in this light. So there have been studies where if you say you get like like people that are working on stock markets um, and their professional traders and things, well, potentially um, you see that their probability rating scheme is more close to seeing them accurately and, you know, being more rational and just more accurate. Right. Um, and therefore, you know, one thing you might say is, well, maybe people just need to have more experience of the world, of, the, of, 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 of the, that domain, and then they will make better decisions. But the problem is, is that you can't have experience in every single domain possible, right? And I think this gets to the heart of what something like personality theory is. It's like, okay, fair enough. You can say, oh, since we oft these heuristics often can go wrong, um, despite how useful they are, we should therefore try and be more conscious and active and try and override those. But we actually can't. There's some fundamental way in which, given the fact that the world is comprised of ill-defined problems, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you can't just ignore the fact that mm -hmm. there are going to be... And, and that's why I get, I, I'm, find, I'm, I'm finding it then so fascinating to think about mm -hmm. this in relation to personality traits, because now you're saying, okay, you know, what in what fundamental ways could we actually even measure how people mm -hmm. see and view and understand the world uh, in different ways, and and mm -hmm. how and and just the the ways and potential for how that might help us understand people better is kind of immense mm -hmm. to me. So so that's well, uh, hence why I bring it up. Let, let's build up to personality now. I think some of the uh, basics are in place. Um, I think what is basically happening in behavioral economics is a kind of thematization of some basic uh, aspects of our problem solving in the world. And it sort of goes all the way back down to basic biology, actually, because what you're faced with in the world is always this sort of um, this problem of having to weigh your risks and then to maximize um, gains and minimize costs minimize losses, things like that. And, you know, the, the typical sort of survival game is, let's say you're in the savannah and then you hear a noise in the bush. Are you going to, so notice what that world is consisted of, right? It's a world of uncertainty. Something just happened, an anomaly, the no noise in the bushes, and you don't know what it is. You don't know what to attribute it to. The question is, is it dangerous or is it not? Or more than that, is it dangerous or is it not dangerous or is it potentially rewarding or is it not? Because it could be one of three things. It could either be a lion that could that's waiting to right, pounce you and eat you. That's danger. It can be nothing significant. That's neither dangerous nor rewarding. Or it can be a rabbit that you yourself could catch and then get dinner on the table for, for the night. Um, now, the, you know, human beings are, we're, we're, we are at the top of the food chain, but a human being against a lion, that's not, uh, that's odds are very, very low that you're going to survive. So, uh, uh, sort of like from a, from a basic evolutionary perspective, um, the, if we weigh the probabilities, the risks and opportunities in the situation, it's much more costly to assume that it's nothing or that it's a reward than it is to assume that it's a threat. So what seems to be happening on the one hand is a weighting toward risk aver aversiveness. And it's a kind of a priori assumption that gets built in as a kind of ev evolutionary heuristic, right? We're, we're already get and, and think about how that actually manifests it manifests itself. It's not just a thought. You, you have an autonomic nervous system response. Physiologically, you tighten up, you uh, your pupils dilate, your heart starts beating faster, everything else sort of freezes so that you can focus on whether to run away or to fight or what. So the heuristic, the way it's enacted, isn't just as a thought, 
It's an embodied pattern of unfolding that takes place at the level of body in relation to situation. That's thing number one. Thing number two is you still got to account for all the times that the noise in the bush is actually nothing and all the times that the noise in the bush is actually something good. So there's also a, a sort of selective pressure to be oriented toward the unknown as potentially rewarding. To perceive the unknown as opportunity for reward. And the way that plays out physiologically is, again, you get attuned, you get interested, you want to approach, you want to explore. The underlying machinery for reward uh, seeking is actually exploration. Exploratory behaviors and attitudes. Just the exploratory orientation is itself what becomes the response to the unknown as the alternative to uh, the unknown as threatening. So you get this basic division of right the possibilities for orientation and action. How should I orient myself toward the unknown, all things considered? Especially when you lack expertise in a particular domain, you're going to need some a priori to come in and fill the gaps, to pre-structure, to pre-figure how you're going to orient yourself toward the unknown, all things being equal. So that's the basic economic problem as it pertains to our relationship to uncertainty. And Essentially, you, what you see in uh, uh, personality at the level of the big five traits is a description of individual differences of how we orient ourselves toward the unknown with respect to ensuring a sense of security against threats. The three traits that evolved to fulfill that function are conscientiousness, neuroticism, and agreeableness. And how we generally orient ourselves with respect to possible rewards. And the traits that evolved to fulfill that function for us are traits openness and extroversion. And we could talk about each of those specifically uh, uh, next. But first, let me pause and ask you, how does that sound in terms of the link between the, the, the meta problem of weighing risks and potential benefits um, uh, with the basic survival, uh, the bioeconomic problem of having to survive by achieving an optimal orientation with respect to the unknown, all things considered. It's, it's really helpful, especially because when you bring up the bioeconomic problem, um, it becomes obvious, um, for example, that the gains or potential opportunities is a fundamentally different kind of thing than potential losses of, 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 of danger. Because danger is, is something which, yeah, it can kill you versus rewards there's you could say limited upside and that is just like a you know a biological fact and so um when economists before it's only been like the last recent decades when they would say actually no we're gonna have to think about risk preferences differently depending on the reference point depending on if it's gains or losses now i'm not gonna say that economists were like idiots and they didn't realize this was the case obviously it was just a case of parsimony what things are relevant and what are not but economists have just gone, well, no, it is actually a genuine, relevant difference. And we're going to fail to understand how people make decisions mm -hmm. if we don't take into account the reference point, so to speak. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, it's... So personality traits kind of... And 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 so so I would just say, though, I, like in hearing you, obviously I understand the big five, but in hearing you map out um, the way in which personality can kind of give you um, these problematizations of how should people respond to different kinds of threats and rewards. And I know this gets even more nuanced if we speak more when mm -hmm. we speak about cybernetic big five and things. It just like giving me the insight that it's going to be sort of really helpful for thinking in a more nuanced way about the many different domains of how people make decisions um, such that. Um, making it even more nuanced than just gains mm -hmm. and, and losses, say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, could, I, could, I, could I make a quick point before I forget, actually, on, on just this topic? Because um, in my head, I made the point and then I forgot and I was like, oh, shoot, how am I going to remember? So it just came back. So I don't want to lose the opportunity to voice it before we move on. Um, now, if you think about this idea of um, 
mathematically calculating the actual weight on the po the probability of loss versus the probability of probability of gain and how that acts as the sort of criterion of what the most rational decision would be all things considered in a situation where you're faced with an economic problem of decision making what what the mathematical calculation itself presupposes is precisely the kind of expertise that you would need in order to fit yourself to match yourself to the world that you're confronted with instead of having to rely on biases that might be prefigured by individual differences in, say, personality or intellect or things like that. And so th I think I think this is really interesting, actually, that the problem of risk and benefit never actually goes away. But uh, by acquiring the relevant expertise, you become more fitted to the actual relevancies that right. are invariant features of that kind of world. So um, in the absence of expertise, we might hypothesize that people are most likely to fall back on what is, well, there's two possibilities, either on what's typical of like any human being, which is essentially what the heuristics and biases literature, I think, helps to thematize the entire list of heuristics and biases that apply to all people, all typical human beings, at least like ideally speaking, even though there's culture, there, there's definitely like cultural bounds and constraints that are at play as well and cross-cultural questions. Or as an alternative hypothesis, which is where I guess our conversation might lead, that in the absence of relevant expertise, what people would fall back on is their own typicalities, their own unique trait configurations. Those would have a uh, at least a kind of moderating effect, if not a mediating effect, on how they, uh, the kinds of heuristics that they resort to in order to make sense of and uh, cope with the uncertainty at, at hand. Right, yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I really like that because, again, in like thinking about these kinds of problems and just reading more deeply behavioral economics, I'm kind of, I, that's what just a broader theme I've been thinking about. Okay, yeah, we you can map out in general humans could pick out from this selection of biases and heuristics and it's like a kind of yeah a menu of things they could do um but i don't think enough work has been done on how might people select and engage different heuristics and biases and how might differences and how they they play out show and so for example this is why i've been so fascinated by the fact that we can measure for individual people like a probability weighting function because that's like a um a, a more uh like continuous and, and quantitative way you could do that um and and again we could you know one has to go into more detail of to what de degree that's helpful again how to what degree can you map on uh, uh, the, you know you're making decisions based on probabilities versus again you're someone in an embodied embedded um environment you know because one one thing that came to mind when you brought up, you know, you're in a savanna and you're trying to evaluate, you know, could this be a threat or, or actually is there a possibility is there's actually like a meta problem of, and but this is a, of first, is this something you have, it's like you, for example, you might say something like, do I need to engage, you know, neuroticism versus extroversion version here? Not that we do that some, in some conscious way, but the system, you know, and that's, that's, that's something that say economists have grappled with is what is the reference point? Like when you when you start evaluating uh -huh. monetary gains and losses, actually, mm -hmm. what is the reference point? And sometimes uh, the it, it can be, it can change. That it can actually, it, it can change depending on the situations of the task. And so sometimes it's just you know what you 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 have given at the start of the experiment or whatever. But you know, is it you know your overall wealth level uh, in your whole life, or is it just based on what someone else just did to you? And now the the thing that someone else has done to you is really salient. So just to you know, just so let's money talk you... about that. Let's talk yeah. about that as well. Um, are, are you finished with the point, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was... Okay, cool. Yeah. So, okay, I I recently came across this article. Uh, let me tell you the name. It's called the diversity advantage, an explanatory framework for personality traits. Um, I got both excited and a little frustrated actually when I came across <laughs> this article because essentially, and I, I haven't had a chance to uh, uh, deeply look into it or the literature that it 
sort of takes up as its background. Um, but uh, essentially, I've been working on an idea that this article seems to be seems to have fleshed out like a lot more fully than I have uh, by a different name. And so I, 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 I'm sort of saying this right now just to like be intellectually honest that there's another line of thought there that uh, others have been working on um, that's, that talks about the same thing that I'm going to talk about right now, but in my own terms. Um, what they're calling the diversity advantage, I'm calling the master of all trades hypothesis. And it's this idea that the world is so complex that there's really no such thing as a free lunch from the point of view of whether I should weigh the risks and opportunities in this direction or that direction. And so what I want is to have a population that's diverse enough in terms of individual differences in these weighting uh, uh, specifications that even if individual members of that group or society mess up here and there, the group as a whole will have an, a kind of adaptivity or adaptation to the variegated environment that would make up for these uh, individual uh, uh, um, drawbacks, let's say. And so what you see is, uh, right, the, the, the group as a whole becomes the master of all traits. Th that's where the, uh, the term sort of comes from. Because uh, you can't have a master of all traits personality. The best you could have is either a jack of all trades, which maybe minimizes risks all across the board, but with that also ends up minimizing the potential rewards to be gained. Or you could have specialists, masters of one or two trades max, which really maximizes rewards within a narrow range of domains, but um, uh, right is, is much worse off across all other domains, let's say. So th this group level adaptation, it really makes up for, uh, it's a way of optimizing the trade-off between um, uh, risk management and um, reward acquisition at the level of groups. Okay, uh, so interested readers or listeners, check out the diversity advantage theory if you can get to it before I, I do, or check out my dissertation where I talk about this as the um, sort of evolutionary factor or driver of individual differences in personality. Because in this case, what you see happening is the reason why individual differences in personality traits exist, if we really apply this line of reasoning, right, is to, um, uh, because it's adaptive at the level of groups. And so this answers the question that you were raising that's raised in the world of economics around where these weighting differences might even be coming from and like why they should even be there. Well, because there's no way to predict in an a priori fashion whether to uh, uh, try to mitigate risks and orient yourself to the unknown as though it's threatening more or to do the orientation toward it as though it's more promising. There, there's no way to know a priori when you're confronted with wholly novel situations. And we are, at least some of the time, confronted with wholly novel situations. So there's limits to what expertise can give us in terms of how to optimize our uh, uh, our weightings, so to speak, between risk versus re reward management, security versus exploration. Yeah. So let me pause there. Well, you know, it's um, like what, one thing is that it's making me think that personality is something which must be adaptive on for an individual, but then also for, for groups and, and they, I, there's some in, in a, interpenetration there. So, so yeah, I mean, one reason why there are differences in personality is that on a group level, it's kind of um, like in the Enigma of Reason by, by Mercier and Spur, but they argue that the reason why we have um, sort of confirmation bias is actually because in groups, we can better achieve and argue uh -huh. with each other and come to better outcomes and then uh -huh. similarly with with personality if we all have different personalities we wouldn't want to have though we wouldn't want to find some optimal middle ground personality and then all have that 
just as Mercier and Sperber and the Enigma of Reason will, will argue against the fact that, you know, reason, reason is some generalized, perfect thing that we, you know, the, the, the humans have as a faculty. Actually, it's not that. It's actually kind of a specialized way of making arguments. And if, if people are good at making and evaluating their own arguments mm -hmm. and the arguments of others, um, then, then that in some meta-optimal sense, that's kind of better. Uh -huh. um, so, and... Uh, it's um it's fascinating because so so me and John Hall again we one theme that ran through our conversation is um kind of the order order and specialization versus change and chaos of you know you know you're in a valley and you know, you really specialize the hunting in that specific area but you know someone is realizing hey guys um the water doesn't look so good anymore and you know the yield we're not getting as much yield as we used to so you know should we be moving to another valley at some point, you know, and how do you make that decision? Um, yeah. And it gets to the sort of autism schizotypal spectrum, which you know, people like Brett Anderson have just, you know, really this helped. This is the exploit, today. explore trade-off. Yeah. Th there's a lot of work on this and there's also work that's going to be forthcoming. I mean, I'm being a little uh, presumptuous here, but that, that's okay. I'm confident about it. There's going to be forthcoming work on this, at least in the next year or so on uh, subsuming the exploitation exploration framework uh, into the relevance realization framework so that the, the best way to conceive of this is not as a difference in exploitation exploration strategies per se, but uh, between efficiency and resiliency strategies. Um, for interested listeners, again, go to the RR framework, uh, uh, a lot of the work that John has done on this um, uh, to see what the difference is. So there's a, an impor important nuance there that um, uh, could help to unify several different theoretical frameworks here through our, our relevance realization. Yeah, but yeah. I just want to mention that. Yeah, it, it's um, I mean, on that on that point, because it's it's helpful because from what I understand, like you're an activist for you at the Big Five. It, um, the fact that we have say openness and extroversion under plasticity sort of umbrella, and then you know, agreeableness, neuroticism, conscientiousness under stability one. So, so would you say that those two plasticity and stability, they 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 would map onto resiliency yes. and efficiency? And yes. do you think that's the better meta trade conceptualized trade off? That that efficiency and resiliency is something which actually subsumes something like exploitation and exploration. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Because the basic problem that you're tackled with in reality is something like. In order to ensure security, I need to find what's invariant, okay? What's invariant in the environment um, uh, so that I can stave off threats and risks and things like that in the least metabolically costly way possible. And in order to maximize reward through opportunity, what I need to do is seek what's variant and then cope with change in a way that's uh, adaptive across time. And that's why things like openness, for example, or exploration, really, um, um, are, that's where they, they come into play in some sense. So um, exploitation is a way of minimizing costs in my survival strategies, let's say. Uh, I'm going to... Um, uh, uh, we're going to stay in this valley, for example, because we don't know what lies out there. If were we to venture into the unknown, there might there is the possibility of reward, but we might also get killed by predators because we don't know what's there. Um, but how far can you really stretch that strategy? Really, how far can you push it? There is a limit, but it's it's impossible to know what that limit is objectively. Because you're always just gambling, right? You're always placing bets against uh, uh, right reality, so to speak. You're always making predictions. And the way you make these predictions heuristically corresponds to the thresholds that are described and quantified by these individual differences and in traits. Uh, trait neuroticism, for example, um, is the threshold for how much uncertainty you can tolerate before your defense systems kick in and you get anxious or angry or depressed or self-conscious or whatever. Um, and so again, the heuristic sort of uh, uh, 
the, the, the heuristic mechanisms that are at play, let's say, or the heuristic processes, they're affectively enacted, they're embodied, they're physiological, they are pre-reflective. And individual differences in these measures of neuroticism, let's say, are going to correspond to how much uh, inertness and how much dearth of resources and scarcity somebody can tolerate, let's say, until they're like, I can't take this anymore, we need to do something about it. Yeah, uh -huh. I like that. I like thinking about um, like the idea of minimizing costs kind of being a more you know, stability thing and then maximizing benefits, maybe more plasticity. So like I remember even just going back into the classic classic of the literature just in my research of this, like Jordan Peterson and Colin DeYoung having an article about dopamine versus serotonin. Uh -huh. And just even in general, just think about it again, you know, biologically, dopaminergic systems of seeing rewards as different system to seeing um, costs. Um, and uh, it's interesting then to kind of think about you know, the trade off of like, again, this like example of imagine the tribe is thinking, you know, should we all actually move to another valley? Um, I remember seeing like a, a, a economics paper kind of actually saying that um, given the fact that uh, we have like a kind of present bias, it, it, everyone in general has some degree of sort of present bias and we have this, you know, quasi hyperbolic discounting uh -huh. often. Um, if people, if people are actually like too conscientious and too aware of that, um, they're really good at minimizing costs, but then in a scenario where benefits are increasing out into the future, they're actually, they actually become worse off <laughs> and they, they, they actually, they actually, if it's a stranger, they actually, they start consuming the benefits too early on for some reason. I would have to yeah, look more into that, but, but there's some way in which I have to, yeah, it's actually kind of, it was kind of a counterintuitive conclusion. But for Can you some say reason, that again? Could, could you yeah, for some, for some reason, imagine people, they have this way in which, you know, imagine people know that when they, 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 they get into like the future and there is a reward, um, they will want to take it. Um, therefore, going backwards in time, they look at the future and go, I know I'm going to be like that. Um, so... So let's can we talk about this in reference to like the marshmallow paradigm? Yeah, right. I think so. Yeah. Can you walk me through this in reference to? I know that if I, the longer I hold off on eating this marshmallow here and now, the higher the likelihood that I'll get another one later. I don't know when, but it'll come later. So how does this trade off play itself yeah, out? Yeah, I have to think. I have to look more into this paper to be honest, because it's it's hard to because <laughs> it has a counter kind of intuitive conclusion. Uh, of the fact that actually, for some reason, um, people who, in a way, just they don't, they they take like say, imagine they're more plastic, more extroverted, and they just take opportunities when they come. Um, maybe in 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 a scenario of of that, they'll just they'll they'll be able to just take on more benefits uh, in general as and when they come, rather than planning excessively and saying I'm going to have. I'm not, yeah, I'm not too exactly sure. I would have to look more into uh, the paper and the conclusion. Are you but... able to uh, uh, repeat the conclusion itself? Like, yeah, I think this was the conclusion. Yeah. The claim. Mm -hmm. the, conc the claim is that uh, um, if they were, if people are naive about the fact that they are present biased, then you know, imagine you, you keep putting putting off doing your homework, right? And the costs are increasing over time. So in the last, in the you know, you, the opportunity cost is you, you know, you could keep going to movies and the movies are getting better and better. Mm -hmm. So that's the cost. Um, and so if you have to do your homework in the last week when you have to do it and now there's no, there's no way you can get off doing it, then you're going to miss out on the great movie you could have gone. You should have just done the homework four weeks earlier. So in a, in a scenario of the costs are rising, the opportunity cost in this case, um, then if you, if you don't realize how you are going to act uh, and you're, you're present biased, then you're going to do badly because um, you're not going to just going to get the cost out of the way. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone who actually just appreciates how they act, um, mm -hmm. or the, I mean, or someone who's just just time consistent in general, they're actually not present biased. Then they'll also do fine in that scenario. Um, uh, whereas, but then if you take this this person who is, they they actually are present biased. They just don't. They, they, uh, but and so because so, I think if someone's time consistent. They so would you're fine. you're taking so there's got to be a counterintuitive conclusion which we've yet to get to and what you're saying is what we actually find happening is when people are naive as to the reality of hyperbolic discounting then 
what happens that they counterintuitively outperform uh, or yeah, they do they do badly when costs are increasing but counterintuitively they actually do better at people who hyperbolic discount um oh that makes uh, sense okay when the benefits yeah. are increasing and i'm not yeah if you yep. if it makes sense yeah okay, so sure. yeah yeah the, the, sure why, but... so, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll let me situate this in a kind of clinical um uh, 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 context actually so okay. what we see happening in the worlds of people who uh, meet the criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, uh, um, is actually, okay, so there's two things. Trait conscientiousness is negatively correlated with the uh, attention deficit component of ADHD. So the lower you are in trait conscientiousness, the more scattered your attention is. All right. And uh, agreeableness is negatively correlated with the hyperactivity component of ADHD. So the less agreeable you are, or in other words, the more disagreeable you are, the more hyperactive your presentation will be. Being restless, not being able to sit still, you know, needing to move from one place to the other. Uh, and of course, the, the the other three traits could also factor into this and change the presentation. But these are the two main correlations that I'm aware of in the literature so far. Now, another thing that we know about trait conscientiousness is that people who are high in trait conscientiousness, they are very mindful of the future. In some sense, they actually live in the future. When they're faced with a task, what what's most immediately present to them isn't the reward and getting it here and now, but all the right steps that they could take in order to ensure the reward, which will come in, you know, in due time, let's say. So there's actually a, uh, uh, on one of the self-report measures of the big five called the NEO PI3 or the NEO PIR, which is the previous iteration of the NEO. Uh, there's a, you've got trait conscientiousness and conscientiousness breaks down into six sub factors or facets one of which as far as i remember is called impulsiveness trade impulsiveness or it might have been moderation but i i don't remember but essentially what it seems to be measuring is um uh okay ho hold on there's quite a bit to unpack here and it's important so bear with me here if that's okay so look conscientiousness is a very perplexing trait because what you find is that it's differentially correlated to both trait extroversion and trait neuroticism. Collins framework, uh, 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 Colin de Young and Peterson and Quilty, uh, they're the authors of this framework, the big five aspect scale. It takes each trait and breaks it down into two aspects. All right. For trait conscientiousness, it, uh, the two aspects that are there are trait industriousness and trait orderliness. Now, what they found is that trait orderliness, trait orderliness correlates uh, negatively with trait neuroticism. So the more orderly you are, the less neurotic you tend to be. What, what, bas what that basically says is that the more attentive you are to rules and procedures and structuring your environment and structuring time and space, the less negative emotion and like defensiveness you actually experience across time. So a part of trade conscientiousness is related to the threat system and the, the security system. That's point number one. Point number two is that the other aspect of conscientiousness industriousness, that's actually positively correlated with the reward system, extroversion. It's really interesting. Uh, and what therefore seems to be happening at the level of mechanics here is that conscientiousness is what accounts for the, the individual differences that we see in how people prioritize goals whether the goal is to avoid a threat or pursue a reward, by the way, that's what goal means. It's not about uh, rewards. It's about either rewards or threats, right? It's how we prioritize goals across time scales. The higher somebody scores on trade 
conscientiousness, the greater the tendency that they have to prioritize long-term goals over immediate goals, whether the goal is to avoid a threat or to pursue a reward. What that means in this case, bringing it back to ADHD and bringing that back to what you were saying in the, uh, in, in the study is that if you're high in conscientiousness, you are going to, um, you're going to, what, what we're going to see is less of a, um, um, it's not going to be a difference in who performs better than who. What, what we're going to see is first and foremost, a difference of whether I, the goals that I see are further out into the future or closer to the present. So if, if, uh, in the in the example that you gave in this study, uh, the counterintuitive sort of um, conclusion was that you see people who are, when they're naive as to the reality of hyperbolic discounting, so uh, self-regulation or uh, inhibition of uh, 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 immediate gratification is sort of like not really there or it's less there than it could be. They that fits them to a world where the rewards are present and to be had here and now with a sense of immediacy and urgency so that when they're in that world, that's how they will respond to it. They will go for what they see. Whereas people who are more oriented to rewards and opportunities and risk management as it takes place across longer time scales, they're more likely to forego immediate rewards. That, that, that's how the mechanics of it, I think, plays out if we really put all this together. So I think what's at play here mainly is differences in trade conscientiousness. And um, uh, yeah, that is the trade-off that we see happening in trade conscientiousness. The more future-oriented you are, the more likely you're to miss possible rewards and opportunities that, that exist closer to you in the present in an immediate sense. And the more the lower you are on trade conscientiousness, the more you're likely to miss long-term goals, goals that need to be pursued. Look, like getting a PhD, for example, is the type of problem you solve over the, over the time scale of years, four or five years, six years. There are lots of problems in life that can only be solved across long time scales of, uh, right, spanning multiple years or even decades. So, at the same time, there are problems that are, they that that exist across shorter time scales. Like, what do I do today? What do, what do I do? What do I do right now? What do I do that I'm here trying to focus on my studies and get my life in order? But then I meet somebody who's very interesting, and I know that if I get romantically involved, that might distract me from all these other goals. But now I'm faced with a basic economic problem. Do I? allow myself to be distracted given that I might find my life partner here or do I so it's conscientiousness that's sort of at stake here from the big five point of view I think yeah yeah definitely. it's um and I should say like the study I brought up wasn't an empirical one but just a theoretical one thinking oh. about being time consistent versus not and being um hyperbolic discounting and then whether you know that or not and and I just I mean, one could, it might be interesting to actually do an empirical study and then say, well, then does conscientiousness, could that map onto like an understanding of the present biased nature of, you know, your extroversion and other short term traits and therefore um, your ability to plan? Because um, I really like that you say, for example, with conscientiousness that you almost live in the future. It's like it's kind of that is salient to you. I mean, as someone high in conscientiousness that even I was describing it to a friend, and that's kind of what I said. It's like, I don't think, I just like, it actually wouldn't be fun for me to like eat this enormous cake right now. I actually just don't think it would like it because like I know I'm going to feel awful, you know, and it's going to disrupt this and that goal that I have. I'm not going to be able to uh -huh, do work uh -huh. in the evening. I'm going to be half dead, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, uh, it's, 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 it's really interesting. I'm not sure how we brought up the conscientiousness. Um, it was probably my bringing up this, this study, but I'm really liking because the reason why it's been interesting to think about different personality traits and why that's helpful is like even um, in just thinking about what, you know, what predictions would one even make, what hypotheses would one think about if you're looking at differences in like probability weighting function, differences in how people see Absolutely. the world in these scenarios. And, and like, the, I think this is a very crucial theme actually for 
uh, economists and psychologists and cognitive scientists and philosophers to really consider it because like human beings are the animal that discovered the future in some sense. Our, our, our life world, it, it's a temporal life world. Uh, our existence is temporally extended. Our temporal horizon, it extends way out beyond just the next day or month. We have the power really to imagine and envision a future that takes us all the way beyond our own lifetime even. And that's where we get into all sorts of like philosophical and existential issues of like, what's the meaning of life if my life will end in 50 years and then everything continues forever, for example. Um, but the point here is that what this means in terms of the economics of life, the bioeconomics, is that the problems we're now tasked with solving are problems that could exist across several different timescales simultaneously. And so I could always choose to solve this problem here and now to get its benefits, even though that might distract me or become a problem for solving this other problem that exists and ought to be solved across a, a, a much longer span of time and vice versa. What's the right answer to this problem? Nobody really knows. You can't know. You can't because that requires prediction. That requires probability waiting. And the moment probabilities are involved, certainty goes out the window. And now you're, again, being called to orient yourself toward uncertainty. And what better way to orient ourselves toward uncertainty than through individual differences, which are the basic heuristics that we're uh, equipped with at birth because of how this has benefit because of how this benefits the group as a whole and how it adapts to the world, both in its dimensions of certainty, both in terms of the, the known and the dimension of uncertainty, the unknown. Yeah. I mean, I want to, I know we've, we've touched on this a lot of certainty versus uncertainty. Um, but even just, I'm thinking back to some papers I've been recently reading in economics and they kind of say that like our typical economic models perfectly fine in situations of certainty that, but you know, the only time you need to even implement loss aversion and, and reference dependent preferences is when there's uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. because if you can, if you can perfectly predict something, I mean, why would you be loss averse? I mean, you, you just, you, you, you know what you want to consume, uh -huh. but it's just when something you suddenly realize, you know, you're, you you have less money now in the situation or, you know, your budget constraint and economics, you know, collapses inward and it has a different mm -hmm. shape now. Well, now what do you do? You know, how, now, how do you trade off uh -huh. things? And, and, uh, and, that, and then it starts changing. Um, and I mean, what, one question I wanted to ask is it would help me understand personality theory and it might, might be relevant here is, um, do, do people differ based on, is plasticity stability, this meta trade-off, is that something you could measure, um, helpfully outside of the personality traits? Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, uh, another one, oh, for example, you talked about in say one trait, like conscientiousness, there's two aspects, a positive and negative, you know, one that's more related to extroversion and one neuroticism, right? There's orderliness, uh, uh -huh. orderliness, and there's also injustiousness, right? Um, and uh, would someone who is more orderly in say conscientiousness, would they have be more likely to be that more stable trait in other traits? So they're orderly in conscientiousness, would that then make them more likely to have the, the sort of more stable that dimension and that two facet theory in extroversion and agreeableness um, because ever so slightly, as far as I know, ever so slightly, there are yeah. weak but reliable correlations. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, so that would make me think that there is some slight way in which people differ in terms of stability, plasticity. Uh -huh. um, um, but the reason, and the, this might not be related, but like, there's something I've been thinking about too, is, um, so yeah, Brett, Brett Anderson has been helpful in like categorizing autism schizotypal. Mm -hmm. And he actually has a paper about kind of um, the degree to which uh, in predictive processing, it's sort of to do with um, the kinds of sl error slopes you want to minimize. Meaning, for example, someone who's more um, autistic, they don't mind minimizing getting small rewards. They're fine being in a situation that's known and say, you know, say they're better at programming because mm -hmm. the slight gains they can make from incremental improvements 
um, is actually like fine for them. That that's really good for them as a cognitive system. Whereas someone who's more schizotypal, um, the reason why they might care about bigger patterns and, the, and not care as much about mathematics and smaller details is that they're trying to get bigger gains. So they're like trying to like um, find relations, you know, go to different scenarios and or just find. It doesn't mean they can't actually focus mm -hmm. into one area, mm -hmm. but they just they, they whatever they're doing, they want to find some way in which it fits into like a, and they can sort of suddenly get you know a really big gain, um, and so it's kind of like different orientations to, and I just wonder like, are they the same thing? Is autism a kind of stability and uh, an and uh, an efficient an efficiency sort of paradigm where they're just more efficient, and that's why. You, people differ in trait in like not trait, but there's a the autism schizotypal dimension. Or I was just I've been thinking, is this plasticity stability and then autism schizotypy? Are they maybe like in a way too like correlated, but actually different kinds yep. of problems? That's that's yep. what I've been really thinking about. That's a um, great question. And um I I've I, I don't know what the authors of the original papers would say about this, but I do the, think that yeah, I think I, I, this is why I'm bringing it up is I think, uh -huh. I think, say someone, yeah, like, like Mark Miller and Brett Anderson and John Verbeke, I think they might say that they are the same, basically, like, like that, like, like that, like, autism is an stability, they're kind of basically the same in schizotypy, um, yep. and, and plasticity are kind of, because, because, because in that paper, they kind of talk about schizotypy is, it's, it is correlated with, um, extroversion and openness. It's about change. It's about going and trying to create new situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it's of interest to me is that, I mean, I actually think I am someone who is more in the schizotypy kind of style of thinking. And yet I'm in general more on the, the stability side of the different traits. And I just noticed that I'm thinking about like the phenomenology of my experience yep. and how I am more orderly. Yep. Um, and, and so that's why I think it might be actually helpful to actually think that they're actually like maybe even like some way orthogonal kind of ways. That, of, that uh, is how yeah. I'm inclined to think about it too. And actually this is something that I would level against the relevance realization framework in its original formulation itself, that what it construes um, as the fundamental trade-off taking place at the highest level of the cognitive bioeconomy is the trade-off between efficiency and resiliency. And uh, these two constraints are placed on a singular sort of spectrum, that the more you tend toward one, the less you'll tend toward the other. Um, okay, that's not what the personality literature seems to be indicating as to what's happening at the highest level of um, uh, personality and the personality hierarchy, let's say. What seems to be happening is there's two distinct and orthogonal functions that are both active at the same time. Um, and there tends to be a negative correlation between the two. So they could leave the semblance of existing on a single spectrum because what you tend to see is the more one tends toward the other, the less one tends toward one. But what you also see happening clearly is the the less common the, the less common but nevertheless equally possible in actual cases where you see somebody who's not, who's high on both who's high on openness and extroversion so they're quite exploratory but they're also high on conscientiousness so they have motivational and temporal stability they're high on agreeableness so they're high on social stability they're low on neuroticism so they're high on emotional stability what you also see happening is the exact inverse of that, somebody being low on both stability and plasticity. And that's what you get when you, like when you've got somebody like that, the kind of world you're now experiencing is a world where um, the temporal horizon has really narrowed and shrunk to almost the, the, the time scale of days, if not hours. And, Nothing is really anywhere for more than just a moment. Everything is in chaos and it's hard to come to grips with anything really. And it's also hard to move out into the world because you're afraid of going beyond what you immediately and presently know as well. So both the stability function and the exploratory function 
seem to be uh, limited and severely restrained in some sense. So it's interesting to think about the kinds of worlds that correspond to these differences in personality traits, which is where the relationship between personality and perception actually comes in, which is not something that I think most people have thought too much about, too deeply about. And that's why this is really a phenomenology of individual differences that I'm trying my best to really advance here. Because uh, it can help us to empathize with people and their worlds of experience by using psychometrically validated measures like the NEO, for example. And it could also maybe help to tackle some of these more basic, right, primordial economic problems and issues that economists uh, try to understand. So, okay, let me pause there. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts or reactions about that. Or if That's it helps really, to make sense of your question. Yes, it's it's really good, and and it, it does make me think that yeah, there might there might be some reasonable way in which thinking about those two plasticity, stability, and then autism, schizotypy as slightly different, and and um, both helping kind of flesh out how people differ and how they see and understand their worlds. Um, I also I'm just just want to say that I like that we've come to at least some kinds of conclusions about how yeah, economics relates to sort of personality theory and phenomenology because as I said I just started when we started this podcast I was like okay here we go I'll try and lay out some things and see what happens and so I'm glad that that it kind of was helpful um in uh -huh. understanding the link between the two and it's giving me lots of I'm just writing down so many things and there's like just lots of ideas it's giving me for things that need to be researched and um like especially because yeah I think um, I mean, psychologists and economists have been talking to each other a lot, but I think with, with personality theory, I think it's just, um, there are some papers on it, but I think, again, if we just do like these correlations of like, and especially if people don't understand personality, so they do correlations yeah. and then they like, with extroversion, and they don't like appreciate, well, like, do you know, do you realize that the different traits are correlated? And maybe if you looked within a trait and like, you know, there are, you know, there could, you could have a two trait theory or a six trait theory. So what, what do you care about? Um, or, or sometimes people will do studies of like, but I mean, the reason why I like big five is that again, it's like evolutionary and just sort of, there are reasons why we have the different traits. So sometimes like they'll just start aggregating different traits and then make up their own name for something. And I'm like, but what, what does this mean now? You know, you're like, you're, you're doing some like machine learning cluster analysis on the traits, but like the good thing about something like the big five is that there's meaning behind, because again, because if the reason why we want the meaning. And why we want, we, we want a reason behind why extroversion or why neuroticism exists is precisely from what I set out to do in this podcast is like understand, yeah, like things like probability weighting. If we don't, th that would help us give us like clearer predictions of exactly how people see the world differently. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just in a way of like, again, I think economists wouldn't care about phenomenology. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's actually yeah. the kind of thing that any of their hypotheses would theories predict. I mean, that's actually probably something precisely they ignore. <laughs> And, and mm -hmm. no, I'm not saying that's a bad mm -hmm. thing. I don't. I don't think every mm -hmm. scientific field should it, it, it should look at everything. Nevertheless, um, I think phenomenology and thinking about people's experience can actually help us perhaps even well, make better economic here's, predictions. Here's the thing that, like, I think, ironically, and and uh, well, it's not ironic. It's just unfortunate. I think in our modern sort of psychological and even philosophical understanding and culture, the real value and purchase of phenomenology has been lost and conflated with uh, something like a kind of subjectivism. Phenomenology isn't about subjective experience. That's not what it's actually about. Phenomenology starts out as actually a critique of the division between the object and subject, the world and the self. And instead, what it tries to advance is an understanding of the self as always only ever situated within a world. So to bring a very, I think, relatable example to bear, people who are experiencing a state of panic often report feeling like their world is about to end and they're about to die. It's, it's really weird how you could feel that way when uh, uh, you're, you're you know, about to miss a deadline. No pun intended there, by the way. But what seems to be happening at the level of physiological response is heart rate gets elevated. Again, maybe pupils dilate, you start sweating, 
you're filled with terror. Do you know when the body responds that way? When a prey is faced with a predator. Well, the Grim Reaper is the ultimate predator. And in states of panic, what you're actually confronted with, the world that you're actually responding to, is a world of dying, of death that's imminent. And that's not at all visible if you look at the person panicking from the outside, from the sidelines. You miss that if you adopt a strictly objective or scientific, uh, not scientific, scientistic, natural scientific sort of lens. What phenomenology tries to do is invite us back into the world of perception. The world of perception being a reflection of this structural relation, this mutuality between a self in response to a world and the world only being there for a self to be experiencing. So I do think that there's probably some hidden value and treasure actually to be found by economists, for example, or other scientists uh, by taking, in, taking into account the reality of the structure of perception as consisting of these structural mutualities between self and world. Yeah, There's an adaptivity there that would otherwise be lost. What I feel is in response to something happening that might otherwise be invisible from the lens of the naturalistic framework, let's say. And so it, it, the, there's something very intangible, but nevertheless real. There's something invisible, but factual going on. And the real question is how can we make it more palpable, more tangible, more concrete for the purposes of scientific investigation? That's, That's really, what yeah, in yeah. activism, which is phenomenology in the scientific context, I think tries to do for people. Um, anyway, let awesome. me pause there. The, yeah, I have yeah. a lot of opinions about this this area of of psychology and science and whatnot, but um, uh, I I thought maybe it could you know act as a bit of a um, an an invitation actually to take the reality of perception a little more into account or seriously mm -hmm. than otherwise would be the case because it's usually chalked off as being purely subjective, but that's not the point of phenomenology as I already said. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I have some more like specific questions, but honestly, that's a great sort of end point and natural end point for our conversation. So do you have any, I, I, thank you. And do you have anything else you want to add? I mean, you affect some of the conversation just now. So that's, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. One more thing, a half joke, but it, it's also half serious. You should, <laughs> you should write a paper called something like from the economics of certainty to the bioeconomics of uncertainty. Yeah, that's sure. already a nice workable title uh, where you control for uh, expertise and you get people to face certain economic problems and see if their decisions, the kinds of individual differences in, uh, you know, if any do emerge in the kinds of heuristics that they employ or the biases they fall into are m mappable to the uh, uh, personality type variation from the big five point of view. And then you might have an answer as to how important really is uh, the individual differences in big five measures to how we cope with economic uncertainty. That would be so helpful, yes. Personality like versus excluding it and then certainty versus uncertainty. Just a really clear kind of, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you for having me back here again. Chat. This is very fun. <laughs>